Hi everyone, I am here with Imam Muhammad Tawhidi. How are you doing, Imam? Good, thank you very much. Pleasure. And we're here in Washington, D.C. Uh, I should probably start by asking what brings you to Washington, D.C.? Well, firstly, thank you very much for uh, having me. Uh, secondly, I come to Washington, D.C. quite a lot. I do a lot of uh, advisory mm -hmm. work with uh, certain figures in this region as well as Canada um, and uh, you know I reached out to you wanting to sit down and I have my reasons as to why I picked you uh, but yeah let's get the introduction going first well no we, we, we can't we can't move <laughs> past that um, some people who don't know you're probably wondering why you're not like chopping my head off or something <laughs> okay uh, I've been interviewed by many people. Uh, so far, I've given over 400 interviews. And there's always this 1% uh, in people's minds that, how do we know he's not lying? Mm -hmm. How do we know he doesn't have a different agenda? So I said to myself, who is the one person I can sit with that would definitely know if I'm lying? That would definitely know if I have a point, if he can see where I'm coming from, and if you can understand and relate to what I'm saying. So who's that one person? And also has to have a good audience, uh -huh. uh, speaks English, so I can speak in English, knows the books I might reference, Brother David. <laughs> so I reached out to you and said, you know, I'd welcome an opportunity to record a video with you uh -huh. so that our both our audiences, we share a lot of mutual uh -huh. audiences, can uh, see this side of the story as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, that, that, that's important to note that we share a lot of the same audiences. Like, um, I've mainly followed you on Twitter. Right. Um, and I noticed you've, for years, been condemning a lot of the same things I condemn. Uh, you talk about a lot of the same issues uh, that I talk about. But um, on, this, <laughs> on this issue of, uh, of deception... Takia. Yeah, I find that whenever your name comes up, People start saying, "No, he's just trying to deceive us." So, for 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 everyone who isn't familiar with the issue, um, you have a, you have a verse in the Quran which talks about not taking friends of uh, the disbelievers in preference to the, to believers unless it's to guard yourselves against them. And when you look at the commentary, such as Ibn Kathir, um, it's basically he it gives he gives uh, quotations from Muhammad's companion, like Abu Abd Darda who said, we smile in the face of some people, although our hearts curse them. So I'm someone who, who points this out, but uh, it's never occurred to me that this means that, that all Muslims are, are lying. In fact, my, my, my position is I, I believe most Muslims, when they say Islam is peaceful, genuinely believe it, even if I disagree with them about what Islam teaches. But there are people who simply think that any time someone is saying something they disagree with about Islam, it's... It's deception. Someone is, is trying to mislead them. Okay, well, there are two issues that need to be clarified here. One is the verse that you mentioned, mm -hmm. and the Quran is full of these verses. Uh, one of them, which you mentioned, do not take the disbelievers as allies uh, or as friends. To begin with, I'm not taking anyone as a friend. A friend is a different level. I say we are all human, we are all by default one family, and we have to love each other. To me, a friend is something very distant than saying human. So when I say you and I are humans, that's closer than friends. So I acknowledge your right to live and exist, and you are equal, just like me, and we are sharing this planet together. That's closer than friend. So... This verse in itself is referring to the societal uh, situations between the Meccans, the Arabian Jewish tribes, the Persians, as well as the businessmen that would come through Mecca. Mecca was like an economic city where many tribe leaders would come and, and travel through there. And they would come with their alcohol, with their animals that Muslims can't touch. They would come with their food that Muslims can't consume. And because of that, there was a lot of mixture between two cultures. And whenever one religion feels that it's being influenced by another religion, such verses tend to make sense, that don't take these people as your friends, meaning do not marry 
uh, and do not give, do not marry from them, and do not allow them to marry your women. Don't drink their drinks. Don't eat their food. It doesn't mean uh, kill them. Again, I don't deny the wars that did happen. But in this specific situation of friends, uh, what do friends do? They sit and they share and they enjoy themselves together. And it's just a verse to remind the Muslim to preserve his or her culture and to not, uh, let's say, give up their religion for the sake of friendship. That's what this verse literally uh, refers to. That's the first one uh, that I wish to clarify. The second point is taqiyya. Taqiyya is a totally different issue. Taqiyya is a concept. The verse you cited is a order from God. So a concept is not an order. A concept is a theory. A concept is something that can be applied and not applied depending on the situation and time. Two different things. When it comes to the, uh, the order of don't have people as friends, I need to come to the meaning of the term friend. Me and you can sit down. I can call you brother. I can attend your, your house, your, your events, because you're not influencing me. You're not trying to convert me in any way, and neither am I trying to convert you. And to a certain degree, many other faiths would say, don't engage with the, with the Muslims or don't engage with the Christians, such as India. In India now, they don't even want Christians to talk to Hindus because they feel that just by talking, they're going to convert them. And you have organizations against converting uh, Hindus. But just to clarify this one point of taqiyya, taqiyya basically means to conceal uh, the truth in order to protect your life. Now, what taqiyya, the terminology, literally means uh, is, for example, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll give you an example. If you are being targeted because of your faith as a Muslim in a, let's say, uh, uh, in a communist like China today, if they knock on your door and, and they say, we're going to take you to the camp, you can say, I'm not Muslim. And you can save yourself from going to the camp. That's what it literally means, and that's what it is literally used for. Now, where does taqiyya start? It starts from the Shia. We Shia, our the sixth uh, descendant of the Prophet Muhammad, Imam Ja'far al-Sadiq, Ja'far al-Sadiq, he was the, 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 the infallible figure that revived this taqiyya concept. The Sunnis do have it, but that's because Ja'far al-Sadiq taught before uh, Imams they all stem back from his teachings, the Hanafis and the Hanbalis and so on. Uh, so the Shia are the ones that know of this. Now, within the Shia, there's a big uh, divide on using taqiyya. Some say taqiyya is part of religion. If you need to preserve your faith and your life, you have to use it. Some say in a state of uh, safety, you don't need it. If I can call 911, why do I need to hide myself from you? If I have citizen rights, why do I need to hide myself? That's another issue. Now, is Tawhidi applying Taqiyya? No. Taqiyya can only be applied in certain stances. You can't live your life doing Taqiyya. It's not a, a method of life. You can't live and get married and, and have a job and earn an income all based on Taqiyya. That's just something that's not true. It can't, it's impossible. Unless you're uh, literally an agent. Uh, again, if I was applying taqiyya, all the Muslims would know. A Muslim could tell if another Muslim is applying taqiyya. When two Muslims are talking, or talking to a Christian, and one of them applies taqiyya, the other would know. So why are the majority of Muslims attacking me? If I was applying taqiyya, they would be supporting me because I'm infiltrated. Mm -hmm. Look, I'm sitting next to David Wood. Right? I'm, mm -hmm. I'm taking your audience. Mm -hmm. They would be supporting me. But after this, they'll be cursing me day and night because they know it's not taqiyya. Also, I've been attacked by Muslims. I have scars on my body from Muslims. My home has been raided. My car has been demolished. All on the news, all recorded by Muslims. So it, it really doesn't make sense. But then again, I understand that such a concept exists. It is applied today, and it can be very confusing for the people. I hope that somehow explains that. Yeah, um, and, and the, the reason I bring that up is, uh, again, because once you have that in your mind, that, mm. hey, if someone is practicing this, then 
they're going to be saying things that are false, and then you can apply it almost on the level of a conspiracy theory, right? right. It's, 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 it's very difficult to, to disprove a conspiracy theory because the person who believes in the conspiracy can always, any evidence you give him, he can interpret yeah. it in the light of the conspiracy. And so, but I, yeah, so I just wanted to say, you know, I've, I've known plenty of Muslims that I've had as good friends, some of them even convert, left Islam, and they didn't come back later and say, oh, you know, by the way, when I was telling you that Islam is peaceful, I was really planning on killing you, right? So they clearly, they're, guys, there are clearly plenty of Muslims who believe what they're saying, believe that, it, believe that Islam is a religion of peace, and so on. So there is the issue of discussing whether their positions are correct and so on, but don't automatically assume that the people are trying to mislead you. I don't say Islam is a religion of peace. I don't say that, by the way. But so, you're the imam of peace. Yes, I'm an individual who is peaceful. There's no such thing as uh, as any religion uh, being uh, peaceful. Every religion has its violence. Uh, the individual can be peaceful. The scripture has always been subject to reformation because of certain aspects, uh, violent aspects within it. Now, I, many people will come back and say, why don't you say Islam is peaceful? Uh, Islam is not one one book. It's mm -hmm. not one concept. It's uh, two major denominations with thousands of, school, of, of schools of thoughts and within that uh, tens of, of sects and groups. So I can't say they're all peaceful when they're all killing each other. So I, I, I would be lying. So that's why I want to sit with you and you know we made it. So then you can easily identify, at least I trust that you can, at least quickly identify if I'm misleading you. Now, uh, on, that, on that title, why do they call you the Imam of Peace? Well, it, was, uh, the, it started in a very uh, tense moment. I was being attacked by the media. I was being labeled an extremist. Mm -hmm. I was being called the radical Imam. Uh, and, you know, everybody around me, like my team, my friends in Australia, they said, this is nonsense. How can you be an extremist? You, you're so peaceful. You are the Imam of Peace. And it sort of stuck, mm -hmm. you know, that from that gathering, uh, they are the ones who also run my media or did run my media for a time. And they went to change uh, my usernames to Imam of Peace. And it sort of became a brand because that today we live in a time where people like to put other people into boxes. Mm -hmm. So the moment I read it, one tweet from you, just one tweet, a few words, I put you in a box in my mind. Oh, he's far right. Oh, he's this. Oh, she's that. So... We are now using Imam of Peace, so I can assist the public to put me in a box, mm -hmm. right? When they see someone like me, and they get confused, where do we put him, in what box? I'm assisting you in putting me in, in a box in your mind, and that is put me on the peaceful side, and whoever attacks me has to be the radical, because I'm not the one calling for extremism, I'm not the one calling for violence or anything like that. Mm -hmm. um, you, you mentioned a few minutes ago, that you are Shia Muslim. Correct. Um, anything more specific than that, or just, just general Shia? Uh, within the Shia, there are fractions. There are the Ismailis, there are the Khoja, there are the Bohra, there are the Dawoodis, and there are other faiths that came out of Shia Islam, such as the Baha'i faith, which is a complete religion on its own. I am a 12er Shia Muslim, mm -hmm. which means that after the Prophet Muhammad, there are Imams, that uh, an imam here means infallible, uh, who continue the, the message of the, the prophet until the end of time. That's the, 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 the major group within Shia Islam. It's basically mainstream Shia Islam. Mm -hmm. Now, <clears throat> there are also people I've seen who, um, who say that you're basically using your position to go after Sunni Islam. Right. And what are your... What, now would you respond? Well, firstly, uh, that's wrong on many levels. I'll mention a few of these levels. Firstly, I belong to the Ta'i tribe, the Ta'i Arabian tribe, and who are the descendants of Hatam al-Ta'i. The majority of this tribe today are Sunni Muslims. The majority of, of the tribe, which extends from Arabia down to Iraq and so on, and it it includes the, the al Budairi family, the al Nabhani government in Oman, and so on. Uh, we are all one family, and the majority of us are Sunni. In fact, 
our chief, uh, who is called the prince of Tay, the prince of the tribe, is uh, a Sunni who pledged allegiance to ISIS recently. And after ISIS was defeated, he came back saying, uh, I was forced. So what we did was we signed letters and we removed him from that position and we appointed someone else. The point is, my family tribe is governed by Sunnis and the tribal uh, system is very important in the Middle East. So the whole Middle East functions on, on tribes and, and regular governments. So the prime minister himself or the president would be a son of a particular tribe. That's from a family perspective. Secondly, I was educated by Sunni Muslim Imams up until uh, 2007. So from 1995 until 2007, I was educated by Sunni Imams. And some of them are famous today. They are famous radical fundamentalist Sunni Imams. And I don't wish to mention their names because they, uh, they would really get targeted by people online. But most of the, the clerics that come out on Australian TV who are, you know, senior, they were my teachers in Western Australia. Sunni. I went to a Sunni high school. And also, uh, my book, The Tragedy of Islam, has an entire chapter, two chapters, criticizing Shia Islam and Shia Islamic governance. It does not have a chapter attacking Sunnis. Also, when I criticize Sunnis, I criticize the Shia equally. So when I go after ISIS, I go after Hezbollah. When I go after Saudi Arabia, I go after Iran. And this has been my way since the very beginning. And whoever says that I am maybe uh, using my agenda to go after the Sunnis, to a certain degree, one needs to realize that the majority of terrorist organizations are Sunni. The majority of them are Sunni. Shia Islam is only 15% of the whole religion. The majority of what you see are all Sunni. So it's impossible for me to go against militant Islam, Islamists, militant Islam, militant Islamic ideology, without somehow falling into criticizing the, the, the Sunnis. I'm not targeting uh, regular Sunnis, I'm targeting Sunni fundamentalists. It's not my fault ISIS is Sunni. You know, if we had enough Sunnis uh, criticizing ISIS, maybe I wouldn't be bashing ISIS this much. But I see that you guys are doing the job properly. And if they're right, they don't have the platform that I have. Now, I'll give you a good example. Many people say, Imam Tawhidi, why don't you criticize Israel? I don't have a problem with criticizing Israeli policy. But number one, there's, there are organizations criticizing Israel. The whole UN is criticizing Israel. All right? So why would you want me? First, I'm not a rabbi. I'm not Jewish. I have nothing to do with Israel. So why would I? Yes, I criticize Hamas because nobody's criticizing Hamas. And nobody, it's not equal criticism. The UN doesn't criticize Hamas. The point I'm trying to get is I don't really care who's Sunni and who's Shia, who's Jewish, who's not. I care about justice. That's why I criticize Hamas, because I care about justice. I criticize ISIS because I care about justice. The same way I criticize the Shia, I criticize the Sunni, and vice versa. And the people who call me sectarian uh, are running away from a very important issue. And that is the issue of me being a reformist. A reformist doesn't care about Shia Sunni. A reformist looks at the whole religion and criticizes the wrong in the whole religion. Those calling me sectarian, they are the simple-minded people. They are the ones that try to run away from the argument that is their faith that is producing the most amount of terrorists. Um, and, and by the way, we, we'd kind of be in a similar boat on focusing a lot of criticism on, uh, on Sunni Islam. Um, because uh, I do as well. People people ask me all the time, why don't you uh, address Shia Islam more? And, well, th th similar reasons, right? ISIS is Sunni and a lot of the terrorist groups are. Al-Qaeda, yeah. ISIS, Hamas, most of the... Look, we only have two, two Shia terrorist organizations, only two, Hezbollah and Iran. Iran is obviously influencing the issues in Yemen and Syria. But the, out of the hundreds of terrorist organizations, you bring the whole list, 
Only two, less than five, five maximum are Shia. The rest are all Sunni. So it's impossible for me to criticize terrorism and not criticize the Sunnis. It's just not... Long. In fact, the Sunni should be happy that I'm criticizing the extremist. I'm doing his job. So why is he upset? Yeah. Now, uh, you, you mentioned that you're a reformer. A reformist. Yeah. Um, there are basically two types within that camp. There are people who would believe that in early Islam, there, there were calls to, um, to kill. I mean, you did kill apostates and you did, um, uh, you did fight people based on their beliefs and so on. And that, so there are people who would believe that is early Islam, but that we're in a different time. And so, uh, needs to be reformed. Um, and there are people alternatively who believe, no, it, Islam didn't do those things, but along the way, certain Muslims did. And so it needs to be reformed in that sense. So, uh, do you fall into one of those camps, either believing that Islam didn't teach those things, it was Muslims along the way who taught them, or that Islam did teach those things, but we're in a different time, so we need to rethink those? Both of them are lies. Both of them are lies. And let me explain the first part. The first part says the violence happened in the beginning, and so Islam needs to be reformed, and will be reformed, and we need to now start on that reformation. That is a scam. Because Islam as a religion will never be reformed. Two, the, the, the other part that says it was all peaceful. The caliphates came later on and they started the bloodshed and we need to cleanse the religion from the very caliphate. That is also a scam. Because the caliphate, the, these were not uh, regular governments. These were governments established by the word of God. So both of the types of Islam they present, at the end of the day, are religious. They just have a problem with them. If you have a problem with the religion, the problem is with you, not with the religion. You're the one who's wrong. This is how the religion was, and this is how it operated. Now, there are many types of reformists. Osama bin Laden says, he said I was a reformist. Al-Baghdadi today says I'm a reformist. What does reformist mean? Reformist, in my sense, I am a social reformist. I will tell you, Islam will never be reformed. Never. Never, ever. Not even, you bring the biggest forces on planet Earth, bring them together, unite on reforming Islam, it will never happen. Why? Simple answer. Islam, according to all Muslims, is the word of God. Literally, every letter came from God. Reformation is man-made. Muslims will never accept what is man-made over what they know for sure is the word of God. So all of these millions of dollars into the Muslim reform movement and all the all nonsense. It's a scam. And this is why many reformers do not like me. There are Muslim reformers, Shia and Sunni, who do not like me. They are 100% anti-Tawhidi. Because Imam Tawhidi is they're realistic. They're Tawhidi folks. Yeah, it's, I'm being realistic. How can you reform a religion? That's not if it's not broken, why fix it? You can't. So I say, okay, we had bloodshed, we had wars, we had crusades, and my ancestors were, were part of the conquests. We had all of them. Now, can a Muslim find a way to coexist? Can Imam Tawhidi find a way to message David Wood and say, brother, can we sit together and show people that this is possible? Is this possible? Yes. And we have. We have countries that are reformed, Muslim societies. Look at Dubai, look at Oman, look at Kuwait, look at the UAE in general. The beheading that is promoted in Saudi Arabia is frowned upon in these countries. And the Westerners love to go honeymooning there, they love to go there. Maldives, it's a Muslim state, right? So I think we need to uh, take a look at the two types of Islamic reformation. One is a social reformation. The other is a, a reformation of scriptures and religion. That is the scam. The actual re reformation that we can see today is successful is the social reformation. Where Muslims are now in the UAE from the treasury of Islam, from Baytul Mal, you know what the significance of that is. They are building synagogues in Dubai. They're building temples in the UAE. They're building churches. 
This is a social reformation where you can have a nightclub and a mosque in front of it. This exists on this planet. We're not talking about something in Jupiter. It exists on this planet. You can go and you can see it and it's beautiful and safe and nobody's beheading or chopping hands or anything. And they're all Muslim. And they're all Sunni. And Kuwait and the UAE and Oman and uh, Saudi Arabia all at the end of the day come back from um, tribes that that are in a way or another related to each other. They're all Arabs, they're all Sunni, they're all Muslim, they're all one denomination, one sect. Yet a group of them are now reformed in their society. And they're having relations with Israel, and things are going well. But Saudi Arabia is still, is still lacking a bit of that social reform. But it might get there if it, it, it goes on the same way. When I see those countries uh, heading towards such a success, Right? I welcome such a reformation. Why not? Because that comes with an entire curriculum in the schools that is now being changed. That comes with the laws being changed. That comes with women having more rights, unlike Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia lady gets hit by her husband, goes to the police. The police calls her husband, come pick up your wife. In Dubai, there's an app. From what I heard, there's an app where a lady can report on her husband. If he's locked her in a room or whatever. Uh, so you see the difference between two Muslim societies. And I believe in this social reform the same way I woke up, my community woke up, people like Majid Nawaz, Rahil Riza, people develop in life and they're all Muslim and they don't want to kill anybody, just want to live life peacefully. That's the type of reform I believe in. But to say that we're going to rewrite the Quran. We're going to deal with the hadith. Look, look at the Muslim reform movement. The Muslim reformists, there have been thousands of them, right? All of them were killed by other Muslims. The majority of them were killed by other Muslims. So where was the reform? Look at, bring all the Muslim reformists, and I ask you one question. Have they reformed one mosque? Have they reformed one jihadi fatwa? Do you know of one Islamic law from Sharia law that has been reformed by these uh, reformist Muslims? No. It's just a brand of Islam that doesn't exist and exists only on paper and on Twitter. And you can't reform Islam on Fox News either. You know, it doesn't work that way. So in short, I don't believe Islam can be reformed. I believe Muslim societies can be reformed. And that is why we're heading towards a more democratic uh, system in government and a more peaceful way of life. Um, I'd like to ask you a, a question about um, how you would interpret the Quran. Um, because there, there are different schools of thought on this. And so, uh, to give an example, you have uh, verses of the Quran along the lines of, you know, to you be your religion and to me be my religion, if you have a disagreement with the, with the, uh, with the unbeliever. Um, you have, uh, as in Surah 2, uh, fight those who fight you. So there it's you're fighting people, but not just random people. You're fighting people who are fighting you. But then you have, as in Surah 9, uh, fight those who do not believe in Allah. And so there's a question of how to reconcile those. And uh, I find that lots of times in the West, uh, someone will basically pick one and say, this is the position, mm -hmm. like fight those who fight you, and then interpret the other passages in light of that interpretation. Uh, but you also have, uh, down through history, Muslims who interpreted it uh, in, in light of abrogation. So you have this rule at this time, but then that gets abrogated by this later command, and then that gets abrogated by this later command so that you have, so that you have these, these stages. So um, how, do you, how do you kind of reconcile the different uh, teachings of Islam? Not, not just on that, but, but, but in general. Okay. Uh, there will be a verse which you can put for your viewers. Uh, could you do that? Yep. A verse that I will give you, and I will mention it now. It is a verse that says that nobody shall touch the Quran except for those who are pure, except the purified ones. And this verse, which is on the screen now, or would be on the screen now, is a verse that has very deep meaning in the sense that everybody can touch the Quran, but why does the Quran say nobody will touch it? except those who are purified. And it means nobody will really touch that true meaning of what the Qur'an means, and nobody will reach the actual meaning of what the Qur'an is trying to uh, convey and get across, except those who are purified, 
in the vision of Islam, those who are purified is the Prophet and those around him. So this solves the whole problem of Islamic interpretation. Nobody has the right to interpret the Quran unless you are the Prophet or his family members. No, only the household of revelation. If you're a Muslim and you believe that the Quran was revealed unto Muhammad in the house, then only those who are part of that house have the right to interpret. Only those. And I will tell you why. But l let me be a, a bit more open with you here. Everybody can interpret the Quran. Anyone who knows Arabic can interpret the Quran. Anyone with, a, with some degree in Islam can say, yes, this means that. But do they have the right to say this is the only interpretation? There are tens of thousands of books of tafsir interpreting the Quran, and which you know probably hundreds of them. Tens of thousands of them exist in different languages. Now, all of them are right? No. Why? Because they're humans. I cannot say this book, I believe, is from God. And I will interpret it with the mind of the human being. It doesn't work like that. A human can never interpret the, the word of God and say, this is exactly what God meant. How? How do you know? How do you know? You can say, this is what I think could be what God means. That's a different story. If you believe, if you as a Muslim believe that this is what could be God's law, then you shouldn't be killing people based on what you believe could be, uh, could not be God's law. The only figures that have the right to interpret the Quran and say this should be followed 100% is the Prophet and those around him. Everybody else don't have that credibility. So that's why I say, you bring me a million interpretations of the Quran. If it's not from the Prophet and those around him, it doesn't carry that weight. Just some scholar wrote the book. So what? So what? Now, when it comes to interpreting the violent verses of the Quran, you see, this different interpretation. This means this is another interpretation. You need to search the interpretation, Mr. David Wood. This is the biggest lie in the history of Islamic research. What do you mean interpreting? If you're, if you're reading the verse, and the verse tells you, fast when you see the moon, right? And break it when you see the moon. If the verse tells you pray at this time, and don't pray and stop praying at this time if you're traveling or if you're sick or so on, then it says do exactly that. I am in no position to come and start uh, making my own interpretations, hoping to make some sense out of it to justify my current situation. Doesn't work. Does not work. We have to be realistic. If the verse says kill the believers, I ask you when did it? When was the verse re revealed? If it was revealed at a time where Muslims were at war with the Jews, if Muslims were at war with the Christians, if the Muslims were at war with the, the Quraysh, who were the idol worshippers, then it means Muslims were at war with idol worshippers. And the kuffar here mean the kuffar that Muhammad has come in contact with, which were the people that exiled him from Mecca and made him go to Medina. In other words, his own family members that tried to kill him. Whatever. Point is, that's what the Quran means. I'm not going to come here and, and tell you, oh, no, no, no. This means something totally different. No, but I will tell you that the verses you read are not absolute. They're not words that apply to every time and every era. Because Arabic is my mother tongue, I know. Arabic is my mother tongue. The verse says, do such a thing. It doesn't mean continue doing such a thing. It means in such a situation, fight those who fight you, kill the disbelievers. Yes, Islam says that. I, who, am I, who am I fooling? Islam says that. There are certain areas that Muslims cannot enter. Why? Because non-Muslims are considered impure. Mecca today. Who am I to tell you that's a lie? I can't lie to you. I can tell you that needs change. I can tell you it shouldn't be that way. I can tell you I disagree with it. Right? I can hope there's been some sort of uh, distortion to the true interpretation throughout these years. But I can never sit here and look you in the eye and lie to you. No, that's what it says. Only a coward and a liar will try and bring some other interpretation from some guy sitting in Pakistan tells you this is what Mecca means. No, this is not what Mecca means. This is what you are trying to make Mecca look like and this is not the truth. Every religion has its problems. Every religion has its problems. The problem with Islam is all the, the Muslim hierarchy 
don't think there's any problem. That, that's the problem. The problem is they don't think. They think they are all perfect. Everything is, is glow, <laughs> glowing. But you look at them and they're butchering each other. So how can you accept me, someone with, with a brain that works, to look at you and say, yeah, you guys are having a good time. No. There's something wrong with your interpretation, and that is because now it has been dominated by teachings of men. And like I said before, Islam today put the Quran aside. Most Muslims don't even read the Quran. They don't even understand the Quran. There's Somalia, India, Pakistan. They don't know what the Quran is saying. Some of them do. Majority don't. Even if they memorize it, they're memorizing the words. They don't know what it's saying. They don't know the real meaning. These people, they want to rule uh, the religion. They don't even know what they're talking about. They don't. So uh, we are in a serious mess. And because of that, it has become a religion of men, dominated by men, hierarchies, take finances from people. It doesn't need change. It does need change. It needs help. And there is some change going on. But at the end of the day, it's not enough. And more people are dying in the process. So what can, what, what's the solution? The solution is, we need you to help us solve this problem. Because, number one, we don't have the platform, we don't have the sources, we don't have the protection. So if change was to begin, it would begin in the West or in countries protected by the West. All the countries that have been going through social reform are actually countries protected by the USA and the UK and their Western allies and the investment from the West and the trade from the West. That's how they became such successful Muslim societies. That's the only way. Uh, I have to be honest with you. Yeah, uh, along those lines, um, th there is the question of, you know, how to, how to deal with, with the various problems that are arising. Because uh, here, they're not just, uh, the issue of terror isn't just a, a, an, an Islamic problem. Now you've got white supremacists and stuff going around uh, killing people. Um, but, you know, the, the, the problem that I've seen sort of brewing for a long time is, well, when I explain it, I explain it like this. If you can have, if you have multiple groups in a society, uh, you can have a tiny percentage of the population that, that wants to kill the others, but that can escalate very quickly. So if you had Sunnis and Shias mm -hmm. in the same country, mm -hmm. and um, let's say 1% of the, the Sunnis and the Shias were actually the, the the kind that would want to go and hurt uh, the the other groups. Well, if if the if one percent of the Sunnis um, produce someone who goes and blows up a Shia mosque, now all of a sudden that one percent of Shias who want to hurt the Sunnis can shoot up to five percent, and then so you get a retaliation, and now the one percent of Sunnis who actually wanted mm -hmm. to hurt Shias that shoots up to ten percent, and so those things could escalate very quickly, and. That's just an example involving Islam, but you can have something similar where you have um, people who are concerned about Islam and then they get attacked, but, but now they become more violent. Now they become, uh, they become the kind of people who want to actually go out and retaliate. And I say this because I hear from them dozens of times every day. We need to go and, you know, destroy Mecca and we need to go do these kinds of things. Um, but, I mean, when I see that, I'm like, what, you're asking us to become different kinds of people, right? You're asking us to be the kind of people who are just going out and killing people based on uh, their ideology, which I thought that's what you're against here. Um, so uh, I'm, I'm bringing this up because I'm looking around at the situation we're in right now. And you had a, you had a big mountain of, of ISIS violence, and then ISIS started dying. And we can go ahead and, and conclude with this. Um, ISIS started uh, falling. So the terrorism stopped, started dropping because there are lots of people who believe that you, you're, you have to be ordered by a caliphate to go, out and, to go out and kill. And so when ISIS was ordering that, you had a, you had a spike. Now it's falling, but now it looks like it's, it's picking up and just having a random attacks. Now you've got mosque attacks and church attacks and all kinds of other attacks. So what, it looks like things are heading in a worse direction rather than a better. So what do you do? Uh, ISIS has not been defeated. And ISIS will never be defeated. ISIS, the only thing that will happen is the name will change. And the faces will change and that's it. The ideology of ISIS existed from day one. From day one. Muslims wanted to kill their own prophet. And he had to put Ali in his bed and flee from Quraysh, who wanted to kill him, the tribes of Quraysh, and Muslims who told them where Muhammad was sleeping. <laughs> so 
His own fathers in law wanted to kill him. Which explains why he married so many women. Why did he marry so many women? Why? If he wanted women, he doesn't have to marry them. What's this alliance? What's this bond? Nine women. Why? Some say 11. Why? Because he wanted to be family with them so they don't kill him. If I'm family with tribe X, tribe Y, that's allies with tribe X, cannot kill me because I'm their son. You see what I mean? So what does this tell you? A guy is marrying from everybody around him because he doesn't trust any one of them. <laughs> he doesn't trust any one of them. In the middle of the war, they were the ones who would start the war with the Christians. They were the ones. The, the, Muhammad's own fathers-in-law and his very close companions would start war with the Christians. Then take Muhammad to go to the battlefield. They would leave him and run away. <laughs> they were the ones. In my book, I proved it. They would leave him and run away. And then come back after three days, blaming each other for being cowards who left the Prophet alone in the battle. It's in my book with concrete original sources and scans available on my website. So, and my book is the only book that I know of that has references and has the online scans, original scans, on my website for each number for you to see in Arabic and some of them I translated as well. But the point is, they were the ones who wanted to kill the Prophet. The, well, in my book, I've proven the, the Muslims insult the Prophet Muhammad more than any other religion on the face of the earth. This drawing cartoon, there's nothing compared to what they say about him. Anyway, uh, and it's all in my book. The point is, ISIS is not new. ISIS is not new. Trump says uh, Hillary created ISIS. Obama created that. That's wrong. In my opinion, they only funded ISIS. They funded an ideology that was already there. They didn't create. They don't know how to create anything such as this. This is world dominance. If she knew, if Hillary knew how to create ISIS, she would have won the elections. ISIS is a very sophisticated ideology and methodology of establishing caliphate on the face of the earth. If Hillary was this smart, she would have won the elections. But no, they funded such a corrupt ideology that already existed. And now they're saying, oh no, this is not really true. This will go away. We'll defeat it. No, you'll never defeat it. This will stay. And it, we had Al-Qaeda, went Al-Shabaab, went uh, Boko Haram. They went al Jaish. They went, now we have ISIS. They went, and now we look at all of them, they're all here. Al-Qaeda is expanding, it's having a negotiation, the Taliban are now negotiating with the USA. All right? They're all, every terrorist organization that was, uh, you know, described as defeated, they're existing today and they're in politics, and the, the Muslim Brotherhood. Did you ever think that America would really need to be so cautious in designating a terrorist organization as a terrorist organization? How weak have we become and how strong have the extremists become? Honestly, it would really take the president so much effort and research to finally make a decision that yes, this terrorist deserves to be called a terrorist. And they're already registered as terrorists designated by half of the Middle East, Muslims like them. So the ideology of ISIS will continue, and the only way it can be defeated is if the Christians woke up. Brother David, with you, with you I can I like say this. I like that point. With you, I can say this. The only medicine for ISIS is the Christian uprising. I'm not calling for an uprising or anything. I'm not calling for any crusades. I'm telling you, if we want to be realistic, the only medicine for ISIS and their likes is when the Christians rise to defend Europe and defend their sacred sites and their churches, that's the only way that these people will wake up. Look, at, I'll give you a good example. From 2014, ISIS took over Mosul, I was in Iraq. I packed up, came back to Australia. From that time until now, can you mention one Christian defense force that stood up for the Christians in the Middle East? The Christians of Iraq are now becoming extinct. Literally, there are only hundreds of thousands of them left. And the majority of them want to leave and have left. The Christian lands are being now divided by the Turks and the Kurds and the Iraqis. And they're wiping it out, this whole history. And I, I just came back from Chicago. I was with the Assyrian community. I met with their bishop. 
they're becoming extinct. Why? Because nobody chose to rise. Because the only medicine is not America. It's not the, uh, the Iraqi forces. It's none of this foreign aid nonsense. The only way ISIS will be defeated is if the Christians in the Middle East showed some strength. The same way the jihadi defends his mosque, you need to defend your church. I'm not calling for violence. That's the last thing I would call for. But what I'm saying is you need to be realistic. If you can't protect yourself, then you cannot blame the, the lion you know, or the coward in this sense from coming and eating. These people are animals. You know, Even animals are better than them. But the point I'm getting across is that we are trying to treat a person humanely when they're not human. They're not human. ISIS, they're not human. You know, we can say they're brainwashed and, you know, the person who blows himself up is also a victim of his own ideology. Ah, nonsense. They're not human. They're doctors, they're engineers, they're people who, who went through medical school, who joined ISIS. They're judges and lawyers. They're not people that, well, brainwashed, don't know what they're doing. They know very well. Very well, we have a terrorist Australian from South Australia. He studied and educated medical school. You know, half the planet doesn't have, uh, more than half the, half the planet doesn't have this privilege. He had the best lifestyle. Packed up, went to join ISIS. Convince me this guy is brainwashed. This guy who spent five to ten years studying to save people's lives is now taking people's lives. Is this being brainwashed? No. This guy debates and he's calling more Australians. Come, come join us. Why? Because he's completely aware. There's no mental illness. Completely aware of what they're doing. ISIS is a political entity. It's religious, but it's also political. Any style of government that wants to conquer has a political motive. And this is a political agenda using religion to justify their laws. And they're using the right, the right uh, laws. The laws are not fabricated. They're right. And they're using them. Now, the problem we have is, when are the Christians going to wake up? We come to America warning the Christians, and the Christians don't want to listen. <laughs> so what do you want us to do? If I'm telling you, I fled from this guy, and this guy is now moving next door, and you're telling me I'm Islamophobe, how can I help you? Mm -hmm. What can I do? If he kills me, then kills you, then I can't help you. It's your fault. Mm -hmm. As in the, the Christian, because look, let's put it this way. There's no such thing as a, a constitution. I see America as a Christian country. I see Europe as a combination of Christian countries. That is what their laws are based on. That is what the constitution is based on. Put diversity aside and be yourself. If you see that pastors and, and priests are being butchered alive, right, you have a duty to rise against the extremism. Especially when you can call the leader of that country and tell him to get his act together. But you choose not to do so. That is cowardice. And that is very wrong. And I honestly believe that if the Christians don't help us in defeating the Islamists, the extremists, then we can never go back to the good old days. And there were good old days. There were good old days in Australia where Muslims were, were one of the first people to step foot in Australia. We have a mosque since the 1800s. There was no bombing or butchering back then. There was a time in America where Muslims did not, did not put halal labels on all, on all the food. They respected everybody. Yes, they were different. Yes, they'll always be different. But it wasn't like this putting stalls and bur burkinis and burkinis. This, is, this means you're out of control. You've lost control. Don't even think about it. So we can't go back compared to now. Those were good old days. You know, we can't go back to those days if they get their act together. Are there countries that got their act together? Yes, Austria. In one decision, 60 imams back to Turkey. Beautiful. Beautiful. So why can't we do it? That's, what, that's the point I tried to get across. Um, one last issue, because you brought up, uh, you mentioned the, the, the cartoons. Mm. Um, your prophet and I have had our differences. Mm. Um, should people like me be allowed to freely criticize Muhammad, the Quran, and so on, uh, because uh, freedom of speech is not absolute. There, there, there are laws saying you know you can't uh, uh, you, you you can't spread slander about people. That's illegal. You can't call for violence. Things like that. So, um, what would your position be on what sort of speech should be permissible with regards to Islam? I would reverse it on the Muslims themselves. 
on the fundamentalist Muslims, of course, which are the majority. You know, the, the people who tell you don't draw, whether they know or not, they are going uh, back to fundamentalist teachings. So they might say they're against fundamentalism, but that very law that says uh, do not draw, that's a fundamentalist fatwa. I would reverse it. When you read the biography of the Prophet, they tell you that one day the Prophet was walking and they threw rocks at him, which you probably heard. They threw rocks at the Prophet. And there is a video clip which you should insert here. I'll send it to you. Where the Prophet is running and people are throwing rocks at him. And he's so merciful, he didn't do anything in return, didn't retaliate. You're just drawing. They threw rocks and made him bleed. You're just drawing. So look at the comparison. He let them go. Secondly is the story which you've heard of the Jewish woman who used to throw garbage in the house on the house of the Prophet on his garden. And one day she didn't throw garbage. She used to do it daily. One day she never threw garbage. So he went and visited her. So neither are you assaulting him. Neither are you throwing garbage on, on his uh, property. You're expressing yourself. You want to draw? Draw. If you want to draw, draw. I don't see where Allah gives me the right to kill you for drawing. Where, where, where does that come from? Yes, insulting the Prophet is a different chapter in Islam. If you insult the Prophet, then there is serious punishment for that. But we're living in a society where drawing is not an insult. Maybe you don't like it, but that's not an insult. Because insults vary. Insults vary. For me to insult Trump, I would really need to do something very serious. For me to insult, uh, uh, let's say, uh, the Australian uh, Prime Minister, I would need to do something very, very serious to insult this person. You know, that's insult. If you go to the Middle East, if you say the leader's beard is not nice, that's an insult. So who defines insult? In the Middle East, if you say, I don't like the leader's eye, I swear, go to Iran and say the leader, I don't like how he looks like. Ooh, you're, you're finished. You're gone for a good week. Why? Because you don't like his face? I don't think that 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 uh, brightness of his face is natural. I don't think it's from God. I think it's Photoshop. You're gone for a good week or two, and your family and whoever asks about you will go as well. So who defines insult? In America, there's no such thing as being insulted from a cartoon. Everybody in this country can be drawn. From the president to the queen to everyone on this planet exists to exist. Everyone can be drawn. Islam, don't they say you have to respect the law? <laughs> the law here is everybody can be drawn. So draw. I don't have a problem with you drawing. In the Middle East, they, the backward-minded people will say this is an insult because insult to them is a different definition. Then again, everybody and their level of intellect, developed societies, realize that it takes more than a cartoon to insult anyone. And if you are still developing, then we'll give you that freedom. Continue in developing, right? But to me, it's very interesting. You know, Brother David, the extremists, if they didn't kill, and if they didn't butcher, they could never maintain their belief system. They could never maintain their religion. They butcher and they kill in order to maintain their religion. Now, I ask you a question. How weak... Must you be? That a cartoon shakes you? People are prepared to come from the Middle East to America to kill an author because they're offended from a cartoon? How weak are you? You know? And then they sit in, in the Middle East and say, oh, uh, de democracy, democracy, democracy. You, can, you sit in America, you can, Ilhan Omar, sitting in America, Muslim, oh, such, 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 such a successful lady. She can insult the president. You know, America, democracy, look at that. Icon. That's Al Jazeera. Al Jazeera is presenting Ilhan Omar to the Middle East as a successful woman. 
who can now go head to head with the president. If she went head to head in Somalia with the neighbor of the president, she'll be cooked. <laughs> because insult. But here, it's not an insult. You see, we're dealing with a community that has problems. Not mentally ill, culturally ill. Their culture has many, many contradictions and many problems. So I say, exercise your right to, to draw. Draw me too. <laughs> I'm probably the only Muhammad you can draw. <laughs> but draw me too. And, uh, you know, this is, this is your life. I can't impose my laws on you. All right, well, uh, thank you, Imam. And I'm going to go ahead and put your uh, links to uh, your book, uh, your social media platforms, and so on. Uh, any final words for, uh, it'll be mostly uh, my subscribers who are watching. Right. Any last words for them? I usually end with one word, uh, one, one line, and that is uh, become people who love. So that's basically all I have. It's been a pleasure uh, speaking to you, brother. And, uh, you know, may God bless you, and may Jesus bless us both. But at the end of the day, I believe we could achieve a lot if we united against the extremists. And I do see that happening. Mm -hmm. Amen. And uh, those of you who watch me, you know I encourage people to leave Islam. I believe that's a quick solution. But for those of you who don't, for those of you who stay in Islam, I hope that you will listen to people like the Imam here. And you. that you call out injustice. Uh, you call out the hypocrites. You call out the terrorists. You call them out like he does. <laughs> all right. See you all next time. Goodbye.